hormones, which is my own account of my own battle with PMDD. I currently live just outside of London, the United Kingdom, and I'm happily married with uh, three beautiful boys. Please do not read this publication if you are cycling with PMDD. I would wait until you at least feel a little better. It does contain um, some very raw material. Um, however, if you are suffering with suicidal thoughts and ideation, it will give you immense hope and courage for the future. If you are a healthcare professional and want to learn more about the disorder and indeed how to prevent a suicide, please do read and share with your colleagues and any other professionals. It's, um, it is my own personal belief that suicide is everyone's business and we owe it to all of those that have taken their lives. Thank you. To learn more, to cherish their memory and to prevent further tragedy, of course, to understand suicide completely, you would normally have had to have been suicidal yourself. What follows is my own account of how close I came to taking my own life, and how I genuinely thought that my family would be better off without me, and how I was saved. The year was 2010. It was a bitterly cold night just approaching Christmas when once again I left my home with the sole intention of taking my own life. The running away drama, which was a regular occurrence in my house on a monthly basis, had come after a very long and arduous week. As far as I can remember, I was around day 25 and all week I'd been struggling immensely with the incessant mental chatter which had plagued me since I was 14 years of age. It's hard to say what was more troublesome, the intense emotional psychological torment or the endless bouts of physical illness as I was also suffering from severe lowered immunity which had often left me hospitalised or at the very least bed bound. This week, this week particularly I had once again had an attack of shingles um, and was both extremely unwell physically and emotionally. I was all, also always chronically fatigued. All day, every day, I was also disturbed considerably, and you will understand this being a sufferer, by sounds of any kind. This so-called misophonia, the sounds of my children playing, for example, the TV, even the sounds of people chewing, would sometimes feel like a physical pain and it seemed to penetrate into my very soul. I would have to put my hands up to cover my ears. Before long, my flight or fight system, which was long overstimulated, would leave me overwhelmed and the compulsion to run away and leave them all was never far behind. I had no control over any thought processing, no control over what would happen to me next. In short, and again you will understand, I was sick of being sick, sick of trying to explain how sick I was, and I was sick of the endless frustration of being so very unwell. Now I can't quite remember, my apologies, I can't quite remember what triggered me off. Um, there'd been so many occasions um, when I'd run away, it's impossible for me to say, but as the week had worn on, I'd begun to self-medicate with alcohol, which, as we all know, is extremely common with women with this menstrual disorder. I just wanted the mental torture to stop, and as I ran out into the freezing night, this, this time I took no bags, as I realised quite clearly there was nowhere else to turn. I was simply done with it all and felt a great sense of peace and clarity. I had no fear and only a sense of tunnel vision as I fixed my thoughts on my only way out. I don't recall a thought for the past, for the future, or even a thought for my family or friends, in fact. I simply wanted a freedom from the incessant mental dialogue that had been playing on and on in my mind. I don't remember feeling as though I particularly wanted to die, but I just felt so trapped, so alone, and just so desperate for a solution. As I walked along so very poorly, I came across a pub which, being a Saturday night, was full to the rafters. 
I slipped quietly through the door, hoping to find that one more drink before I ended my life. As I was well known in our beautiful but small village, I put my head down and hoped that no one would notice my pitiful appearance, which was by now ravaged by shingles all down the side of my face and severe emotional anguish. I asked for a drink, but as it was past the 11th hour, it was refused by the lady who was serving, and as my heart sank, tears engulfed me. I just so wanted a drink, anything to help me. But now it seemed that as though the world had just simply ended and I had broken into a thousand pieces. As I peered upwards, the lady behind the bar looked me directly in the eyes and I just felt the compassion radiate from her. It was a look of great love and of great understanding and she simply said to me, and I quote, I don't know what has upset you today or whom has upset you. But I, have my, I myself have been in your situation many, many times. I'm sorry for your pain, but please hold on, because tomorrow is another day. As she said it to me, words, words filled with such knowing and kindness, I just knew in that moment that she was right. It was a, a dawning, maybe, a, a kind of awakening, and the lenses of my tunnel vision had been widened. I stared intently at her as I took on board what she had said to me. She passed me a drink. I took it and walked out into the night. Once out into the freezing air, I deep breathedly, breathed deeply and I composed myself. And I then did the most important thing I could have ever done. And that was to take my phone from my pocket and I called somebody. In fact, I called two people one who didn't answer, and one that thankfully did. I carried on walking and talking, and she persuaded me to call by, and I eventually knocked on her door. Like a lost child, I sank into her arms and into the warmth of her home. As the night wore on, we talked about my illness, how hopeless I felt, and how dreadful a mood disorder can be. We spoke about my children, and how exhausting and relentless motherhood is. I tried to explain to her how cheated I felt. By now, the disorder had stolen perhaps most of my life and had robbed me completely of my children's most formative years. We discussed my book, which by now I had already begun writing, and how I hoped that it one day would be able to help others. We spoke about hope and how hour by hour Things can often change for the better, how we must be brave and how we must wait for tomorrow. As I grew tired, she wrapped me into a quilt and she held me until I slept, a true friend indeed. In the morning, of course, I felt better, slightly, and I slipped quietly home to face my family. Of course, by now I was consumed by guilt and self-loathing, and as I looked my husband in the eye, I could see his face filled with anguish and exhaustion. Once again, he'd lain awake all night, consumed with worry, and I only felt a sense of remorse and sorrow about what my illness was doing to my loved ones. I had come so close to losing, losing my own life, my children, their mother, and my husband, his wife. As the realization crept over me at how close I had come, I also knew it would only be a month or so before once again my own womb would try to kill me. After years and years of endless trying, the endless consultations with doctors, both holistic and conventional, we knew the time had come and I made a promise to myself to make that call. I knew that I must be brave and the following day I made a plan and I started to hope. On the 19th of November 2012, after several months of waiting and hormonal preparation, I underwent a total hysterectomy and removal of ovaries. I'm delighted to tell you that it worked immediately and it's transformed my life. As well as a return to optimal uh, physical health, my emotional health has been restored and for the first time in 25 years, I am symptom free. I'm a fully functional woman in every sense, and with the help of bio-identical bio hormones, my heart and my bones are also protected. 
This has also rejuvenated my relationship with my husband. And of course, he's delighted. <laughs> my children have a new mummy. And as a result of this new me, I have dedicated my life to fighting and serving this cause. As we know, this cause is greatly misunderstood. Up until now, there has been limited research surrounding the condition, but I have no doubt that in the next 10 years, with the recent merger of the Gia Alamon Foundation, that will, th there will be more resources available and further research undertaken. More needs to be done, more is being done, and lives will be saved. <clears throat> now, if I may address the sufferer in the audience, please, and in particular, those that are suicidal or those that have suicidal thoughts. I know that some of you here um, do have so. Many, many people have thought about ending their own life from time to time. And although these feelings are often overwhelming, they are always almost temporary. When somebody comes to me personally and they are suicidal, I simply ask them to wait a while longer as thoughts can variably change, often from, minute, um, often from minute to minute and hour to hour. I try to allow them to express their feelings and they tell me their problems, of course. But sometimes, very important this, Sometimes we just talk about the mundane aspects of life, which were often forgotten in the ambivalence of the suicidal mind. By ambivalence, I mean that a suicidal woman or man will often be in two minds, and we must remember that suicide is not really about the wish to die, but an, a kind of escape, really. This small window of possible interception is extremely important and can bring about a change of mindset. In other words, just talking about anything and anything, everything, nothing in particular even, can buy time. The most important thing you can do as a suicidal woman, or again, a man, is to tell somebody. You shouldn't feel ashamed or guilty, as quite often the mood disorder itself will be thinking for you and acting on your behalf which of course is the essence of the illness itself. It is not real, it is not you, even though it may feel as though it is. And it is imperative that you tell somebody, a friend, a healthcare, a healthcare provider, anybody. If you feel very unsafe, as Shelley so eloquently said, you may even need to tell a stranger, for example, in a peer support group, a suicidal helpline, it is hard to believe in the throes of suicidal feelings that anyone cares for you. But I can assure you now that we do, we are here for you, and there is, a, there is help available to you, if of course you ask. Do not worry about being judged or worried that you won't be understood. We do understand, and many of us have felt those same feelings, which are often very strong and may seem paralyzing. Sharing that you are suicidal is the most important thing you can do. Remember, suicidal thoughts are the result of being unwell and not the fault of yourself or of anybody else. They are random, they are not part of you. Let them ride over you and pass, no matter how long it takes. Please call somebody, please tell somebody, please reach out. You may feel as though, though I did on many occasions that you have no control over your thoughts or feelings. So the best thing to do is simply hand them over to somebody else. Remember too that when feelings engulf you, you will probably wake up tomorrow and that feeling will have passed. Just as it may has many other times, it does pass. You are not crazy or weak or flawed. It just means that right now, in this particular moment, you have more pain than you can cope with. Remember this is very common and so you could say to yourself I will just keep going for until tomorrow. Tomorrow is another day. I'll just keep I'll just keep going. Another strategy is to find a buddy or a friend that understands you, perhaps another sufferer or a non-judgmental friend. Make them aware of the seriousness of your condition and ask if you can call on them if you do feel like self-harming. This can be particularly affected if you make a kind of verbal pact between you, just to be there for one another. Remember, my friend who I sat with that night, do you remember her? Sarah, her name was. 
She sat with me just as I sit with others because suicide is everybody's business, isn't it? We are there for each other unconditionally, always, every hour of every day. Quite often the loneliness of your illness will be adding to your sense of isolation and a problem aired is of course a problem shared. Remember too, if it is late at night, your feelings can be very intense and it is then that different people in different parts of the world are up and awake when your closest are asleep. This is what makes the International Forum so very helpful in terms of support, that sense of community and women that understands. There is always, always someone to reach out to it's always someone to talk to, even if they're on a different continent and a time zone. Here are a few examples for you to think about. Last month, a sufferer came forward and found she couldn't go on. She felt so unwell, so lonely, and she just had no more inner, inner strength. At that particular time, fortunately, I was in the forum, and immediately I could see how much danger she was in. Well, I can tell you now... Within a few short minutes, women came forward in their droves to help this beautiful young woman who, like a rabbit caught in the headlights, was frozen and backed into a corner by her illness. Within half an hour, no more, we were able to help her gain control. Between all of us, we contacted family members, even the local sheriff's department. Everyone wanted to help her. She was saved. A neighbour of mine who was struggling desperately and I had previously asked her, please promise to tell me directly if you are suicidal. She kept her promise, she came to my home, and I sat with her until help arrived. We talked about nature, animals, and I was able to avert an almost tragic ending. Once again, suicidal thoughts are never permanent. Things do improve. You will find the motivation to live again. This brings me to a very important point about fellow sufferers and the role that we play in each other's lives. How can you as a woman help and how, you, how can you yourself intervene when someone is in crisis? Let's think back to the lady in the pub. What did she say to me? How did she communicate with me? But more importantly, how did she make me feel inside? She said, and I quote, I have been where you are many times. In other words, she was trying to convey a sense of knowing and understanding. She had felt just as I had felt. And more importantly, she had experienced the same feelings. She showed me compassion and love, a stranger, another woman. She made me feel less isolated, connected. And you may recall, this stopped me in my tracks. Quite literally, she altered my thought processes. She intercepted my suicidal ideation and she helped me refocus. She also reminded me, and again, very important point, of the next day and how things can change overnight because, of course, they do and they will. She showed me a perfect understanding at the most imperfect time. If only she knew how much her words meant to me and how much the course they altered the course of that evening. The simplest of sentences, but with the most powerful of outcomes. Let's then think about how we treat each other and how our words can be so important, as in the case of Forgia, bless her. How do we engage ourselves as sufferers and how must we re react to each other as individuals? Quite often there are many women in the forums that are cycling at the same time, so things do get heated, sometimes hostile, hostile and even with many eruptions. Try to stay calm. We must be accountable for our own words, even though I know that's extremely difficult. Please be mindful of the fact that words can indeed be extremely powerful and may even create a trigger, leaving lasting damage and extreme hurt. With my own disorder, for example, sometimes a swear word or a sarcastic quip that would often leave me seething with anger for days. You know, I couldn't deal with it because of my symptoms were so dreadful. This heightened sensitivity is particularly difficult to manage, as we know, and I just felt so out of control. 
Choose your words wisely. Show patience and tolerance with a sympathetic tone. Always bear in mind that others are suffering too. Don't generalise and more importantly, don't antagonise. <coughs> Look out for one another in particular in the forums. Check up on one another. Be aware, for example, is there a sufferer out there that you are particularly concerned about? Is there someone that you have not heard of or not seen of for some time? Quite often the suicidal woman will go to ground or become quiet and secluded. Can you check on them, for example? Can you call on them? Can you be a buddy to someone that you've become particularly attached to in the forums? We've all been through the same disorder, the same misery and personal agony. We must be there for one another. Even when we are strangers, we can support one another. And sometimes even talking to a stranger can be easier, can't it? Last year, there was a documentary on the television concerning the suicide or the attempted suicide of a young man on a very famous bridge in central London. I myself have walked across that very bridge many, many times, and at rush hour, some 60,000 Londoners use it to get to work. This particular man was in crisis and had scaled to the other side, ready to take his own life, when a kind stranger talk, talk, stopped to talk to him. Many other people had simply walked on, busy with their own thoughts and didn't want to be late to, for work. Somehow, the kind stranger managed to persuade him to get help, to wait a while and gently talk to him. The paramedics arrived and he was taken to the emergency room. It, ju it took just 20 minutes out of this man's day to intercept the suicide of somebody very unwell. But what transpired next was the man's subsequent recovery and then his own per personal crusade to find the gentle man that had stopped and bothered to help him. He searched and searched and it took several years of detective work to find the Good Samaritan with newspaper and television coverage, appeals on social media, and several hoax Samaritans coming forward. Finally, however, the man on the bridge was found, and what followed next was the most amazing piece of television I think I've ever seen. When asked, why did you stop to talk to him and help him when others had not? He couldn't answer, but just said that he'd seen him dangling precariously over the edge, and simply felt unable to carry on with this day. This is what I mean by suicide being everybody else's business. It only takes a few words, a little time, and the outcome can change for everyone and forever. Both men who were on the bridge that morning are now huge activists in Great Britain for suicide prevention and have undoubtedly saved many lives themselves. In the days after this documentary was aired, it was talked about endlessly in the UK, and suicide hotlines were exhausted by people coming forward, now looking for help with their own issues. Of course, help is out there. It is available to all, but you must ask. Please ask. When I thought about my own menstrual disorder and how it almost killed me, I tried to think of it in terms of a lesson learned and channel it into helping others. How can I educate myself? How, how can I educate others and support? How can I make sense of something so dreadful that has happened to me and turn it into something positive? The only way forward, I suppose, is to either forget about it, forget it ever happened to me, which of course is impossible, or pass down my knowledge and what I have learned to the next generation and whomever will listen. In terms of your own situation, how can you use it to make a difference? Can you help with fundraising, for example, peer support? How can you help educate? Can you yourself save a life? Will you one day be standing here giving your own testimony? Can you help with raising awareness or with media attention? Is there anything that you can do yourself to raise awareness of this awful disorder? Sadly, however, we have lost people and we mustn't chastise ourselves when a sufferer does take their life, as in the tragic case of the beautiful Gia and just recently Ingrid um, from Melbourne in Australia. 
sometimes there just isn't enough time, enough warnings, and through stigma alone, that person hasn't reached out. This in particular is the reason I've flown so far to be with you today and to share this testimony. <coughs> if I now may address the healthcare professionals in the audience, please. <coughs> My illness itself, my own disorder, some 25 years in duration, was overlooked many, many times. And indeed, there was a certain amount of um, incompetence and ignorance even in surrounding the disorder itself. I simply lost count of the amount of appointments I had, particularly in the early years as a struggling adolescent. I was seen as um, a drama queen, a term I still absolutely loathe, um, an attention seeker. Um, and was even accused at one point of having um, a Munchausen disorder. Um, that's something which has been deeply disturbing to me, as you can imagine. Um, for those that don't understand the term, Munchausen disorder, um, it means that I was pretending to be ill, um, or that I was deliberately, deliberately producing uh, symptoms of an illness in order to draw attention to myself. Um, and for me, one of the most, the worst aspects of being so poorly for so many years was the gradual realisation that nobody was listening to me, no, nobody believed me, and that I was seen as a drain on healthcare resources. By the time I was 17, I had already attempted suicide, and yet not one single doctor, not one, thought to ask me if my symptoms were connected to the menstrual cycle. Here I was, a vulnerable teenager who was showing herself to be deeply suicidal, was often depersonalizing, and was trying to manage severe anxiety. Um, I was also suffering from dysmenorrhea, polycystic ovaries, and yet I can't help but ask myself, how was it missed so many times? Such a waste. Why didn't anybody ask me? And more importantly, how can we change this for the next generation so that other young women who present themselves with the same problems are to at least be believed? How can we help them earlier, quicker and more efficiently? How can we intervene sooner so that many more don't suffer endless years of misery with thoughts of suicide and self-harm? If a young woman presents herself with suicidal ideation, as a professional, I would bear in mind that this person has had to find enormous courage in coming forward. Often it may take uh, many, many years for the sufferer to actually say the words, I am suicidal. I am thinking about harming myself. In my own case, it took, I don't know, maybe 10 to 15 years to say the words aloud, and even though I've been struggling since puberty. I just couldn't get the words out. I just couldn't say them because I thought everyone was going to think you're being overdramatic. Um, I, I didn't want to be judged. I just couldn't actually say the words. Perhaps then, as Shelley so eloquently told us, as a physician, you should ask the words yourself. Contrary to popular belief, asking the question, tell me, do you ever have thoughts of suicide? Have you ever had thoughts of harming yourself? They will not create a trigger. And if they do create a trigger, isn't it all the more important to ask them anyway? Just ask the question. Once a caring doctor has asked, asked that particular question outright, quite often the suicidal person will then open up and then healing can begin. Someone at last has said the words that the sufferer herself has been longing to say. Always take the threat of um, suicide seriously. Never dismiss the suicidal mind. Ask questions, delve deeper, and show the utmost concern. Of course, it's often very difficult to predict who or who will not make an attempt at their own life. Never, bring up, uh, never be afraid to bring up the subject, as talking openly is the only way. Most um, suicidal people in my kind of, when I'm talking to people in peer support or when people come to my home, they're often deeply conflicted and they're looking to seek an alternative to their plan. Just by knowing that somebody cares and is going to help can and does avert tragedy. 
In my own case, finding a compassionate doctor saved me, and it was actually only because of her professionalism that I stand before you today. She found me the right help at the right time, and more importantly, she believed me. So what did she do that was so different to other doctors? Well, firstly, she took the time out of her day to check through all of my history, something that no other doctor, unbelievably, had done up until that point. She believed me, and she learned more about the disorder itself with all of its manifestations. She took the time out of her day to try and figure it out. She acted in the most compassionate way, and she referred me to the correct consultant with the correct expertise and necessary experience. When I told her that I'd run away several times to take my own life, she acted with great urgency, and she pointed out the alternatives. She noticed, too, how ashamed I felt and assured me that none of it was my fault, which, of course, it isn't. She helped me, that's what she did. She just believed me and she saved my life, thankfully. Professor Starr, you believed me. Dr Nick Panay of London's Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, he believed me and he saved my life. They all believed me and because of that my life has changed forever and for the better. I'm now able to help others and I share this testimony because tomorrow is indeed another day. Thank you so much. Sorry. Sorry I'm so nervous.